In this week's video, we're going to review all the steps that we performed to get this 3-MOA Tika M695 to produce half-MOA groups. Stick around. In this week's video, we're going to review all the processes that we did to actually develop a good load for this Tika M695, where we were getting three MOA groups when we started, and I'm going to ruin it for you right out of the gate. We're going to get under half an MOA today. In case you're not familiar with this platform, this is a Tika M695 chambered in 30-06 Springfield. And when we took on this project, we really weren't trying to perform miracles. We're just trying to get a load that's performing better for us for our next hunting season. Part of load development is actually considering our application. Before anyone thinks the goals of our project might be like trying to hit targets out at 500 yards, for this particular rifle's application, it honestly gets most of its action well under 150 yards. The absolute furthest is probably somewhere in the ballpark of 3 to 400 yards. When we ran some numbers for the application distances that we planned to run, uh, the 150s actually came out on top, assuming you can believe the ballistic coefficients that we are getting from the manufacturers. I don't plan on doing an entire video about trying to figure out the actual BC versus the advertised BC. We're at least going to be optimistic and think there's some truth behind them, and those are the numbers we use to run our calculations. When we began our load development for this project, we really wanted to concentrate on quality output. I don't want to say we didn't spare any expense, but we started with good components that we had high confidence we were going to be able to get good performance. The brass we picked was Nosler brass. I did a separate video on the Nosler brass. Essentially, all 50 pieces that we got are well under a grain's total weight from case to case. The internal case capacity is very consistent on these, and we've had really good luck overall. In case you haven't watched our entire project, the projectile we've been working with for the most part is a Spear 150 grain gold dot. The part number of this projectile is 308-150-GDB. We've seen other people talking about some pretty excellent performance with these gold dots, and that's why we really want to try them, and I really have nothing to complain about. I do think they're going to perform well in a hunting application, as well as the accuracy has been pretty reasonable overall. Um, for powder selection, um, what we're going to talk about primarily today is Varget. We've covered four different primers, it's two different powders. With our 150 grain gold dots, we didn't put all of our eggs in one basket. We actually had several other projectiles that we were going to try, but we got reasonable results with the 150s, so that's what we've spent most of our time tuning in our load with. Our two powders that we tried uh, are Hodgkin Varget as well as Hodgkin's H4350, both in the extreme series of powders, both temperature stabilized to get consistent velocities at different temperatures. We've tried four different primers, and the primer we're ending up with today is the CCI BR2. Being as our platform today typically is not going to be at significantly long distance, we did want to have reasonable velocity along with low SDs, but when we were ranking our results for was accuracy more important, was standard deviation more important, being able to achieve smaller groups was slightly more important than the standard deviations we were getting in our particular loads. So we're not going to see any standard deviations that are going to knock our socks off, but we are going to get to half MOA today. So, in case you're new here, and a lot of people are, let's go over our platform as we started today. Basically, this was a stock Tika M695. It had a 2.5 to 7 power scope on it, and that is how we did our initial testing on the platform. Our initial testing with factory ammo produced some pretty darn high standard deviations, as well as some groups that were probably in excess of 3 inches for 3 shot groups. Certainly not what we were going for, but we wanted to get a baseline so we knew where we were starting from. Not knowing where we were going to get, we wanted to have reasonable expectations of at least being able to shrink our group size. Honestly, consistent results under an MOA was our primary goal, and just hitting that would have made me happy. A lot of people early on weren't really comfortable with the scope, and I don't blame them. The final groups that we're going to look at today were shot with my Vortex 4.5 to 27. Certainly not what I would call a hunting scope, but I really want to take the scope out of the application as much. And at the end of this project, we are going to swap out our scope. The scope was certainly not the entire reason for large groups. We stuck with that scope early on in our load development. In one of our load tests, we actually shot 9 out of 10 shots that were well under an inch. So certainly outperforming factory with the other scope. Not saying it wasn't an issue, but it certainly wasn't calling, causing all of our issues. Like I mentioned earlier, our two primary powers we tested with were Varget and H4350. H4350, we were able to get some much smaller standard deviations than what we're going to end up with today, but overall our group performance seemed to be better with Varget. So that's what we're sticking with, at least for today. So let out of the way, let's talk about the reloading test that we ran and the results that we got. The load data for today was primarily generated in quick load, with our quick load pressures adjusted for the actual case volume. Our overflow case capacity is 68.2 grains. According to quick load, we weren't going to exceed pressure until we got to 56.5 grains of Varget, and we're not going to go any further than 56.1 today. 
We had run a velocity test on this in the past to ensure our velocities were where we expected them to be as well as the pressure signs were well within safe limits. One of, the, one of the other key factors too that allows us to get a little bit more powder in our case is we're extending that overall length out. The cartridge overall length we're loading to is 3.300 inches. And for our particular platform, that's gonna be around 30 thousandths off the lands. Our factory magazine actually well allows us to load further than that if we really wanted to, but we wanted to keep a reasonable amount of projectile in the case. That's why we picked that overall length. We would have played with overall length a little bit more had we not been able to get some reasonable groups out of it. And better groups might be attainable if we play with that cartridge overall length a little more. Our first step was picking some very high quality components. Our second step was actually getting our projectile much closer to the lands. Most of the factory ammo we tested was jumping at least 150 thousandths. Not that you can't get accuracy with that, but it just wasn't working in our platform. Getting that projectile closer to lands is what we needed to do. Picking a good powder, picking a solid ignition source, and picking quality brass was where we wanted to go to get some good performance. The dies we're using aren't anything fancy. They're just Hornady 30-06 standard dies. We're sizing our fire brass and bumping the shoulder two thousandths. After we ran our initial velocity test and determined we were going to be in a safe zone, we kind of highlighted some areas that we wanted to cover. Today's testing, we're going to zero in on that velocity that we expected to get to see what velocity combination as well as the groups that we were able to achieve. Let's just go over our load test for today. This is the third firing on their Nosler 30-06 brass. It has been annealed with our amp annealer. During our sizing process, we're pushing the shoulder back two thousandths of an inch. Varget is the powder that we are testing today. We're starting at 55.3 grains, going to 56.1 grains in 0.2 grain increments. The cartridge overall length we've done all of our testing at is 3.300 inches. CBTO of 2.718 inches. And the primer we're using for our project is a CCI BR2. I've actually done some more primer testing with Varget, and I would be tempted to find out if another primer would give us some better performance, but I really need to get this rifle back to its owner so they can get some rounds under the belt and get comfortable with it before hunting season. So those are the parameters for today's testing. Because of all our previous load development, we're fairly confident we're going to be in a safe area for today. And you're going to see towards the end of the video when we look at the brass, no real pressure signs to be concerned of here whatsoever. And we were able to achieve some reasonable velocities. Starting at 55.3 grains, our average velocity was 3,002 feet per second. Standard deviation of 18.3 with an extreme spread of 44. And a reasonable start with a .888 MOA group. Moving on to 55.5 grains, our average velocity increased slightly to 3,020 feet per second. Standard deviation was about the same at 18.1, extreme spread of 51. And our groups held to just under an inch at .975 MOA. At 55.7 grains, we got to 3032 feet per second, standard deviation of 14.7, extreme spread of 40. Groups opened up slightly to 1.508 MOA. Moving on to 55.9 grains, our average velocity was 3,049 feet per second, standard deviation of 11.8, extreme spread of 30, and a 0.418 MOA group. Before we move on to 56.1, one thing I do want to highlight out of that group, even though our standard deviation was 11.8, Four out of those five shots fell between 3,051 feet per second and 3,058 feet per second. Omitting our last shot actually would have had an extreme spread of seven for that particular group. Don't have a particular good reason for it, but I thought it odd. Everything else seemed to want to shoot almost exactly 3,050 feet per second. At 56.1 grains, our average velocity was 3,058 feet per second. Standard deviation increased to 17.8, extreme spread of 41 with a 1.225 MOA group. Some of you are familiar, we've seen this before. This is the 6.5 guys load development chart that they put out for everybody to use. We can see out of all the loads that we tested today, it's highlighting that 55.9 grain load. We can see our spreadsheet is picking out the best load for us. We can see the group size is by far the best group we've been able to get out of this rifle to date. When the spreadsheet is highlighting your best load, it's only going on statistics, not the group size. But probably not a huge coincidence that our best group was our best statistics today. At least for this hunting season, that's the load that this rifle is going to go into the woods with. I have high confidence it's going to perform much better than the factory did, and hopefully down the road I'll have some pictures of what it was able to achieve. And let's take another look at our brass just so you guys can see. Moving from 55.3 grains to 56.1, there's no real excessive primer flattening here at all, especially compared to some of the factory ammo we've ran through it before. Even though our velocities are a little bit higher than predicted, we're getting a pretty solid 3,050 feet per second load. No real pressure signs to be concerned of, and certainly much better accuracy than we started with. Pretty much overall, we've checked all the boxes. We did our velocity tests, we found our pressure, we used good components, we found a projectile that would work well, we shrunk that distance to the lands down, and overall, I think we're able to achieve some pretty darn good performance. 
But as always, I'm sure you guys will decide for yourselves. If you guys want to check out all the load development we've done in 30 odd 6, I'll put a playlist up that you guys can check out. And that's going to go over start to finish all the information that we've done with our 30 odd 6 platform, all the decisions that we made along the way, all the different things that we tested, and how we got to this result. For those of you who've been watching the whole series, I'm hoping we're going to be able to do some more in the future, but you'll have to stay tuned to find out whenever that might come up again. If you're not super into 30 odd 6, we'll probably pop another video up that you can check out if you're interested in. If you have any comments or questions about today's video, put those in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching today's video, and until next week, stay safe and small groups.